In this scene I want us to look at now, there's some quite subtle shades of green that can be quite tricky to get right. So I'm going to show you some swatches of colour that you can then try and match yours to to get just the exact shade. So I'm going to pick up the number six brush and I'm going to take some cerulean blue. Now more often than not I will use cobalt blue or sometimes ultramarine blue to glimpse a sky or a background. But because I want to, a nice cool colour behind these trees, cerulean blue is ideal. And we'll just put a little shape in to show you what the cerulean blue is like. It's a slightly greeny blue, considerably cooler than ultramarine or cobalt. Doesn't want to be too strong, plenty of water in it. So for the second colour, I'm going to start with Viridian. And you might look at that in your palette and think it's a bit unnatural looking and a bit overpowering, which it is, but it makes an excellent base colour for quite a variety of greens. And I'm going to neutralise that green and cool it down a bit with some Cobalt Violet. And I'll just demonstrate this one. You can see that fairly cool almost grey green that you get with cobalt violet and viridian. So the next one is a colour I use a lot of. It's when you want a really dark, strong green. This may be a shadowed area of foliage or a fir or spruce tree. And a good combination for this is to start again with viridian. This colour has to be strong. It has to have plenty of pigment in and not a lot of water. And then I'm adding to that viridian some ultramarine blue, which makes a sort of, sort of turquoise colour. Still far too powerful. But then I'm going to put red into it by using burnt sienna. Then we get a rich, dark green. Let's just put an example of this down here. That's excellent for any time of year for where you want a dense, rich, dark area. So for the next one I'm going to show you quite a blue green. This could be useful for something like ivy or a holly bush in winter. And I'm going to start again with viridian, not quite as strong as the last one, and then I'm going to add cobalt blue to it. Okay, so we'll put a little swatch of this one here. And it's quite a strong bluey green this quite bright it works really well if you get it to blend in with the dark green on the previous one this next one is similar to lemon yellow it's called titanate yellow and it's sometimes called lemon yellow nickel titanate and it's like lemon yellow but it's quieter it's a little bit more white in it it's quite opaque and it's good if you want the brightness of lemon yellow without the acidity well, let's put a little touch of this yeah, it works well in a wash. It also works particularly well on top of a darker colour. Say you wanted to pick out some light coloured foliage, but you didn't want it too strong or too acid with, say, a dark green or a blue behind it. That colour works really well. This next colour isn't a green at all, but it's a really good combination to make a variety of greys for the background or maybe for some distant tree trunks and branches. And I'm going to start with cobalt blue and add to that some cobalt violet. That makes a sort of colour similar to that you might use for a bluebell wood, something like that. And we can turn that into a grey by adding a touch of burnt sienna. The more burnt sienna you add, the browner it gets. So you don't want too much. Just a touch turns that into a nice cool grey. Even though it's grey, you just get that hint of violet coming through it from the cobalt violet. So let's have a look at these colours in the context of the finished picture. I think one of the trickiest parts of this scene are the circular ripples in the water. 
So I want to just show you how I managed to achieve that. I started by drawing them basically in with pencil and this is a very important first step. If you're not happy that they look right with pencil, rub them out and do them again. And don't go on to the masking fluid stage until you're satisfied with them. So I've now got a fine masking fluid brush. I've rubbed it on some soap, make it last a bit longer. And I'm gonna dip that in the masking fluid. I don't want too much masking fluid on the brush because these circles are quite fine. And I'm going to start with the innermost one first. Just gently going over it with the masking fluid. They're not a complete circle, they're catching the light more at one side, so I'm letting them fade out as they get towards the right. Just a couple more. So we just need to leave the masking fluid to dry. Well, now that the masking fluid's dried, I've mixed some washes of colour, and before I put them on, I'm going to just wet the whole of the background with clean water. That's the beauty of the masking fluid. You can now ignore it and just paint in the background. OK, so that's clean water over the whole of that area. And then I'm going to lay in some colours. I've got a bright green made from Oriolin and cobalt blue. There's no sky reflected in this water because it's surrounded by woods and trees, so it's reflecting all the greens around it. So I'm painting these in at the moment deliberately uh, in horizontal strokes. Now there's some reflections of some of the dark shadowed areas of the foliage towards the river bank, so let's use a, a nice strong dark mixture. Yeah, burnt sienna, ultramarine blue and viridian. Still working at the moment horizontally. I'm going to add a bit more burnt sienna to that, darken it slightly. Touch more ultramarine blue as well. So I've got a bit of variety of colour within the water. And then there are reflections of the underside of the bank, which is a dark brown. Burnt Sienna and Ultramarine Blue, and we'll put a touch of that in more at the top edge there. Now because this water's quite calm apart from these few ripples, the reflections are more vertical than anything. So while that paint is still damp, I'm going to take a damp, clean, half-inch flat brush and just wash it down to get that vertical reflection look. It's important to have a light touch when you're doing this or you can find that you've dragged all the colour off. Okay, so that just needs some time to dry. So now that the background colour's dried, I'm just going to remove the masking fluid. And you can see we've got some fairly good circular ripples there. But they do need a little bit of developing. So I'm going to just take the number two detailer brush and I'm going to start with a bit of the dark green and just in one or two areas I'm going to start by thinning the line slightly and to thin the line I just paint a bit more of the green in between them. Maybe thin it a bit more towards that end. they have got a little bump in it there. It's difficult to get masking fluid perfectly positioned but as long as you've got some white there you've got something to work with. OK, I've got a little bit of the bright green as well. And we'll put a touch of that into there. Just thinning those ripples out. Brush is fairly dry, so picking up a bit of texture as I work into this as well. Just a touch more dark green at this end. I've got a damp, clean brush now just to soften that colour in. And now I'm going to wash the brush and pick up a little bit of opaque white. And there's just a little bit of work to develop these lines, particularly around the, the far side of the circle there. I want a line that's so thin it would have been very difficult to put that in in masking fluid, much easier with a little bit of opaque white and this fine brush. The opaque white is quite a strong mixture, almost straight out of the tube. Just take it around the other side slightly. Again, I keep sitting back and checking what I've done so that I don't get carried away and overdo it. So there we have the finished effect. And here you can see this in the context of the finished picture.
In this scene I want to show you how I included these new forest ponies, grazing just at the edge of the woodland. I knew from the outset that they were going to be an important focal point for the whole picture, so I drew them in right at the beginning and put some masking fluid on them. The masking fluid is particularly important because of the way the sunlight catches their backs. For this demonstration I've just included one pony and I'm going to start with a small brush, a number two detailer brush, and I'm going to mix a grey with some cobalt blue, cobalt violet and burnt sienna, a warm grey. Okay, there is more, the, the light is more at the top of the pony on its back and the colour gets stronger as we come further down. So let's start with the neck here and bringing that down into the head. following that shape. Now as I work along I want the colours to soften and blend so I've just got some clean water on the brush and I'm just softening that in. And I shall keep adding water as I work along so that I can take advantage of the dampness of the colour and soften it. Okay a little bit more let's put some colour into the body here. and then with clean water fading that towards the back. Using the brush strokes to describe the shape of the animal, but making sure I do have white paper to contrast with the rich dark greens behind, should really help to make it appear sunlit. Now the legs go quite dark, so I'm bringing some more grey down into there. Maybe a touch more grey into it and as I come down the legs towards the grass I'm going to get a darker grey almost a, a dark brown colour burnt sienna and cobalt blue and still with this fine brush so I can get the legs fine enough darken them as it goes down into the grass I don't want them to suddenly change though to that darker colour so again with a damp brush I'm just encouraging that to soften into the grey. I'm using a bit more of that dark colour to emphasise the darkest tone right under the belly there. That dark tone's okay for this little glimpse we get of an ear there and there's the mane as well. I shall use the dark colour, this is the burnt sienna and cobalt blue just for that glimpse of a mane. Taking advantage of the rough paper to break the line slightly. Okay, let's look at the at the back legs. There's some more grey under here. They tend to merge into one shape here because one is behind the other. But there's a little bit of dark under there again. Quite shaded under there. So there's a bit of a touch of dark. And then I've got some clean water to soften that out there, making sure not to obliterate any of that light colour. We're not interested in fine detail like eyes and things like that. This, it's too far away across the field for that. There's an indication of the tail. We just get a glimpse of the tail behind there. Just a few strokes of the brush. And then I'm going to take some cobalt blue and cobalt violet. If the pony casts a shadow, it will look so much more convincing as part of the scene. And that colour is ideal for a little bit of shadow. And the light is obviously coming from the right, so we'll put that shadow across the short grass there. And for an item like that added to the picture, that is plenty of detail. And here you can see this in the context of the finished picture. So that brings us to the end of the series. I hope many of these tips and techniques will help you with your paintings of trees, woodlands and forests. So bye for now. Now available to buy. Try these techniques at home, whenever you wish. The extended DVD of today's workshop and the book that accompanies this series are now available from the Painting and Drawing channel. For further information and to order your copy, go to www.paintingdrawingchannel.com.